Mesdames, Dear guests, dear friends, first I will speak Estonian and later I will switch to Russian. Those who can't understand Estonian, you can get the earphones near the door and we have also interpretation into English. I'm Malhela, the head of the Open Estonian Foundation and it's my pleasure to greet you in the name of this foundation at the new discussion session of Voices of Freedom series. During the 10 years of our discussion sessions, we have met many people whose ideals are freedom and democracy and whose life and work give hope that a better and a more normal Russia could be possible. By now, the full-scale Russian war against Ukraine has been going on for a second year already. At present, our primary task is to do everything possible so that Ukraine, which is fighting for the future and values of all of us, could defeat the aggressor, restore its territorial integrity and continue the empowerment of democracy. Victory will come and it will mean that the collapse of Putin's regime. But is a non-violent and non-aggressive Russia even possible? Or at least a country that is moving towards such a change? Will Russia finally get out of the vicious circle of dictator cult and slave mentality? Why in Russia a major part of population has closed its eyes to the atrocities which are going on in Ukraine and also to its own non-existent rights and lack of freedom of speech. And we have to understand the mentality of Russians and Today's guest of Voices of Freedom, one of the most respected Russian authors of our time, Mikhail Sishkin, has written about all of this in his essay collection, War of Peace, which was translated from German into Estonian by Tiurelva and Krista Rani for the Loming uh, Library series. And it became one of the most popular books in Estonia. In the analysis uh, uh, of this book, Yuri Zar has written the following in the cultural uh, newspaper Sirp on January 20. However, the most important thing is the hope that came over me while reading this book, that a different Russia is possible despite the harsh fac uh, history. However, Only God knows when it will all start or end. But without the acceptance of its guilt, new democracy can't start in Russia. It's my pleasure to thank their literary festival, Hyadriad, whose uh, Guest is Mikhail Shishkin, uh, now in Estonia. And our today's discussion will be held in Russian. And those who need translation, you can get the earphones. The translation will be into Russian and, uh, sorry, into Estonian and English. Many thanks to the news portal of uh, ERR and Delphi who are broadcasting today's event in real time. And I thank our guest, I thank Hans Hasch Luik, who will be the mediator of this uh, meeting. I thank everybody for coming here and I wish you can get a lot of thoughts here. Thank you and Slava Ukraine. Thank you, Mala.
Yeah, do you have a favorite author? Michael Schicken, do, do, do your audience, I'm so happy, you know, I'm so lucky to, to interview a uh, living writer so far. Well, Michael, we both, uh, yeah, we, we, we were born in 1961, and what is what can you read in uh, international press media about Mikhail? So, the US and the gold medal for synchronized cynicism and sentimentalism we all, will always go to him and to Russia. Uh, and the World Free Journals. The Added again a very known source. And fat fantasy of history and fable and of lonely need and joyful consolation. No, Yapuchal. Well, I have read many of your novels. This is and I would uh, characterize these works as magical realism. Uh, but today I think we will focus on the essay of uh, uh, Mikhail Shishkin, uh, which is titled War or Peace. Well, by the way, your colleague, Dmitry Brikov. Uh, Tolstoyevsky, <laughs> war and <laughs> punishment, probably. This is the new, let's say, word. Well, would you please uh, briefly uh, just present your idea? Maybe I don't uh, understand you well. Uh, well, uh, it uh, comes out that the aggressive uh, tyranny, uh, uh, medieval ter tyranny, is not something uh, invented by Russians they they simply started to uh, to implement the uh, Mongol Tatar York ideas uh, good afternoon good afternoon glory to Ukraine glory to heroes thank you for inviting me here thank you for coming and before I answer your question I'd like to uh, express some words which uh, uh, which are important to be voiced here. All my life I felt a very hard soil under my feet and it was the Russian culture. And within the last year I, I, I feel more and more a kind of a vacuum under my feet. It's very painful to be a Russian today. Well, all words today have to be explained to to define them. What what is a Russian? What to be Russian? Who are Russians? What is Russia? What is Russian culture? For me today, to be a Russian, it means to uh, uh, to experience uh, uh, sorrow, pain, and shame for for what the country is doing where I was born, where I grew up. And I cannot avoid the main question about the guilt and responsibility. I want to to remind you, or, or to 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 uh, remind you one lesson I learned once in my life. It was in Tallinn. It, it's in the book. I was 17 years old, and with my first love. We wanted to do something unusual. We went to our Soviet Europe. I will never forget the feeling of pain and guilt 
I felt in Tallinn when I wanted to ask something uh, in the street from people. Of course, I asked in Russian. And in response, I received silence, but it was so loudly speaking silence. Everything was said by, by this silence, the time, silence. The time an occupant, time guilty in this occupation. The two Russians came here as fascists, and me, well, I felt so much insulted. I was not an occupant. I was 17 years, an, uh, years old. I was for you and my freedom. I was not guilty. What was my fault? This was the lesson for my whole life. So you might be not guilty of something, but you are responsible for your country, whether you want it or not, for your language, whether you want it or not, for your history, uh, parents, for everything. And then, many years later, I visited Estonia many, many times. My books were uh, translated into Estonian, and every time I remembered this most one of the most important lessons I learned in my life. So I'm very grateful to Estonians. They taught me something very important. I feel responsibility for what's going on in Russia, although I haven't been in Russia since 2014. But nevertheless, I am responsible for my language, for the Russian language. Uh, the, uh, the Russian language has become the, uh, become the language of killers, of military uh, criminals. The Russian language and Russia will be associated in the world not with the Russian literature and music, but with missiles which every day fly to or hit Ukrain, uh, Ukrainian cities. I feel that this Russian language, my language, my culture, is uh, is um, is under fire now, and and the the, the and the Rus and the Russian culture is fired by the regime, because the Russian state has always been. Uh, has always been the main uh, enemy of the Russian culture. The regime, the, the, the governmental regime. What, what what can I do? I can do only what, what I can. So to be myself, to, to talk and to uh, write. And uh, with by this, I'd like to to return the dignity to my language, to my uh, culture, and to my uh, Russian uh, literature. And I can uh, do it only by what I'm doing for, have been doing for many years. And the war is not there where, uh, where it's shooting. The war is everywhere in the world. This is the Russian civil war which has never stopped. And uh, the fact that I uh, sit now in Switzerland, it, it's not uh, quite a safe place because I get threats, uh, so mails from, from Germany, yeah, Shishkin is a traitor, death to traitors. What should I do? Keep silent. Then what is the sense of my life? Of course, I'll continue. Maybe it won't result in anything. We've seen that when a war starts, the culture always loses. Literature is a loser, uh, as, as it happened to the great German literature. Uh, it was with the Russian literature, which couldn't, um, which couldn't uh, avoid gulag. And then the Tolstoy and the Crimea War. Yeah. Well, here 
but to prevent the disaster. Uh, neither literature or Tolstoy, they couldn't do it. The all uh, books I have written within 20, 30 years, uh, I published also the, the books of my colleagues, they couldn't uh, prevent this disaster or any disaster. No, they couldn't. And, and again, culture is, lo is a loser. But, but you shouldn't accept it. You, anyway, you have to struggle to fight for this culture, even if we lose. And now, coming back to your question. I'm sorry, I had to say something else. That I said something different. Of course, of course, the major question is: Is it possible to build a human society in Russia, or isn't? Or isn't? or it is impossible. This is the major discourse in Russia, what, what way to, to choose, because the way this country has been living for hundreds of years, it's not a human way of living, and everyone understands it. And Belinsky and Gogol uh, started this uh, discourse. You shouldn't live like this. If you uh, read the letters by Belinsky, these are uh, like citing Navalny, Navalny blogs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Russia, something was uh, something was broken, and now we are just turning around different uh, questions from different periods of time. Belinsky and Nav Navalny say that you have to change the uh, civil status of the country, you have to ch to, uh, to change uh, education, you have to introduce the European uh, election system. And Gogol is against it, for example. He said, what was in 1917? Yeah, everything, everything changed in Russia. The Republic was announced in February 1917. Russia became the most um, free uh, country in the world. So uh, women uh, received their rights, uh, which uh, Swiss women received after 70 years. What, what happened later on? Uh, nothing. Uh, you have to start with changing a human. But how? Well. Uh, well, Gogol says it's possible only by religion and Christ. But I'll come back uh, later to, to this when we'll talk about Dostoevsky. Now, now when we're talking about different periods of period of times, so now we are in this broken time machine. So we, we are again in the period of 1,000 years ago. We are in the Ulus of uh, Golden York. What's going on now in Russia? This is the uh, the Golden York Ulus, uh, and on top of it there is a Khan, and on the bottom there are his slaves, endless. No one has any rights, no private property. You you have uh, and some private property if you are loyal to your master. If you don't. If you uh, if you don't show your loyalty, you are deprived of your property, and everything is built up on violence. And the only sense of this uh, system is the fight for power, which which uh, um, pulls the population into this bloody porridge. A mess, so, and and uh, then if there is no czar, no top, there will be simply bloody mess. And these are the evil, uh, the eternal questions of Russia. So starting from the 19th century, so what to do and how? 150 million uh, persons couldn't read, uh, all right. And the main question for them was the. Uh, tsar is the real one or not? Because if there is a real tsar, then it will be okay, so you can live. But if the tsar, tsar is not a real one, then there will be some difficult times. And how to, d to determine? Uh, there is one way to determine it. This is the w victory uh, in the war. And the war is going on always. If the tsar is strong, he wins. And then he is real. Stalin could uh, kill millions, 
but he, he won, and in the eyes of the population, he is the real Tsar. Gorbachev was very highly valued in the, uh, in the West. He uh, lost the Afghan war, and he lost the Cold War to the West, and he is not the real because uh, uh, he is not the real um, Tsar, and that's why people don't uh, like him, don't uh, value him. So now, all the words about democracy, for example, in the uh, Yeltsin time, so people just understood that they were deceived and the chaos started and anarchy started in the world, in, in the country, and it means that Yeltsin did not show himself as the real Tsar. But G generals came to him and said, we will take Grozny within three hours. And uh, how, uh, uh, how did it end? So he became even less real Tsar. So everyone, um, uh, everyone understood, uh, didn't, didn't respect him. And n now we know how Putin came uh, to the power. So he needed to blow up uh, uh, houses, Russian cities. The, he started the second uh, Chechen war. It was a genocide. And this was the way he became the real legitimate, real uh, governor of Russia. And then you have to prove your, uh, your power. Crimea is ours. Uh, uh, population is happy, and they are crying all for Ray. And they, they consider him the real Tsar, and you have to support it all the time. So generals came to him and said, we'll take Kiev within three, in three days, and we know how it uh, uh, ended up. So any dictator, he loses um, connections to the reality, and we could guess uh, if Putin would have known what would be the end, he wouldn't uh, have started this war probably. And how to this, how to get out from this ulus or this very strong social system, how to get out, how to to transfer, to get to go over to the to the democratic uh, democratic uh, system in the in the um, country where people population really like the ruler. So it's a very interesting question. Uh, so you were talking about ulus. Uh, ulus, I understand this is the. Uh, Tax territory, so, so the territory where the the uh, taxes are collected from some region, and um, anyway, Ulus is a territory. And after after the uh, after the Mongol Tatar York, so uh, the elite. Uh, concentrated Moscow Ulus. When we are talking about Ulus, there was an empire. It uh, consid consisted of Ulusis, yeah. So Ulus Zhuchi was the uh, Eastern Europe, and then the Golden York, and then and then it uh, broke uh, out, and everyone started uh, uh, started uh, fighting against each other, and um, one of these Ulusis was the most uh, Moscovia, so Moscovites, uh, Ulus. So it's, it's impossible to get out from this blind circle so where there is a fight for power, and it's impossible to have order in this um, in this region, in this territory. And in the world of this Ulus, there is no culture, basically. They don't need any culture. They simply are fighting for power. So how culture appeared to, to come to Russia? There was one Khan, uh, this was the Peter. Peter. Peter was fighting against everyone, all the world. But the slaves under his power, they couldn't, um, couldn't invent technologies. And he needed technologies, and therefore he, he uh, he made this, um, he cut this uh, window to Europe to let theater and ballet to, um, to uh, Russia. 
and then he needed also uh, artillery, cannons, and he, uh, and they came also from Russia to uh, from uh, west to, uh, to 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 Russia. Yeah. So and they brought the words which never existed in uh, this ulus ulus. So this is idea, republic, constitution, um, dignity maybe. And a hundred years was uh, necessary to, to 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 make these ideas Russian, so that people would start to talking uh, about it in, in the Russian language. And then the the civil war started between two uh, Russian peoples. So you can call them whatever you want, Russian Europeans or or intelligentsia, so it, a small part of the population which understand that uh, people uh, can live like in Switzerland, that people are not a piece of shit, but they have their dignity and honest and so on. This is one Russia. Uh, it, it, seem, it, 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 it is like there are two different peoples who call themselves Russians, but they are opposing each other. So, so. So, and, the, and the smaller part is the educated, which wants to live like in Switzerland, but the majority, the, the majority are not educated and consider Russia to be an island uh, surrounded by enemies that the enemies want to um, to uh, to kill us, and uh, they will uh, deprive us of the future. And our commander, our general, is in the Kremlin. Between these two peoples, there is a civilization gap. A modern person, a modern human being, uh, answers the most important uh, question of, uh, of life. I am responsible for the main um, solution in life, decision in life, what is evil, what is uh, good. And if I see that my country uh, brings evil, so I'll be the first one to be against my country and my people. But the majority of Russia lives in the in the past. They identify themselves with keen life. We, our kin is good one, and the other kings are our enemies. They all want to kill us. All this NATO, they all only to kill us to destroy us and we want to uh, to uh, to defend our country our motherland like our fathers and our grand grandparents uh, parents did it and every dictatorship uses patriotic patriotism for its own um, purposes my father when he was 18 went to uh, fight against germans yes he went to uh, to defend his motherland but in reality he defended this regime this stalin regime this ulus which killed his father my grandfather who died in gulag you had a poster yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I had the, the poster with the uh, uh, submarine, but uh, in this war in or peace, you um, wrote that uh, your father participated in some fights uh, on the sub submarine, and he. Uh, uh, he drowned the uh, uh, ships which uh, were uh, uh, taking uh, uh, migrants to Germany. Of course, when I was small, I was very proud of my grandfather because uh, he was fighting against fascists and so on. But in uh, but in 1944, there was no active uh, active uh, uh, operations here in the Baltics. But in 1944, there were some uh, submarines uh, which started uh, uh, operating here in the Baltics. They started to uh, to drown, to sink. 
uh, ships which were taking people to Germany out from the Soviet Union. And now I, uh, yeah, now I read every, you, you can find now everything in Wikipedia. Uh, so. So there were reports that they, they they reported that they sank so many so many ships, but in reality they didn't do it because uh, they simply uh, didn't. They were not able to do it. But my father, until the end, uh, thought that they brought freedom to the peoples of. Europe and when uh, during perestroika period um, uh, people started talking different uh, different things so he couldn't believe it so he said that he, he couldn't accept it that uh, our people the Russian people were not uh, fascists how to explain these people now that they were fascists yeah. um, and this is Propaganda what's, what is playing its role here. In the West, I uh, hear very often that in Russia, propaganda is very strong, that there should be an alternative source of information talking the truth. And this truth was uh, was directed to on people 20 years. There was a TV channel, Dozd, and there was a different other media. Uh, but people had to, or were supposed to, to choose between two truth is, well, just Im imagine your parents, your son in, 19 f in 2014 died in Ukraine. This is one truth. And your uh, son is a fascist. He came there to kill Ukrainians who wanted to get rid of you. They wanted to build an independent democratic country. They want to Europe. And you are the parents of a fascist. It's a different truth. Ah, and then the different uh, truth. Your son is hero. The, the Nazis there, they, uh, they destroy, they killed the uh, Russian culture and literature. And your son went there and he, uh, he died as being a hero. He uh, defended uh, Pushkin and Dostoevsky and so on. And you have to be proud of your son. How to, how to fight against it? Well, Mikhail, during the period of uh, Peter the Grand, some opportunities were open. And so from Europe, there were specialists brought here to Russia. And together with specialists, the new um, expressions and words uh, appeared in the, in the language, uh, probably some new uh, models of uh, social uh, system. What is the difference? You have described the situation very well because I'm I'm I'm, I'm really very surprised because YouTube um, in the Russian Federation is open and Wikipedia and whatever you can you can get any information but there is no uh, truth to information everyone is lying. I had a meeting with a Russian guy who well. Um, well, he's quite a successful business and so on. Um, yeah, we were talking about the news, where, which news, Lentaru and so on. And uh, like some of these Solovyovs and, so, and the others, they used to be good, normal journalists. Are they, are they threatened or they simply changed? And he said, Hans, you are an editor. Yes, yes, I am an, uh, I am an editor. And he asked me, don't you ever lie? And I was so angry. And he simply doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, trust anyone. Mm -hmm. And so everyone is lying. So, uh, so but how can it be? Because uh, in Bucha, for example, one is doing what, what happened and the other is uh, talking some different. One is, one is correct, yeah? So every, everything cannot be incorrect. Please, your reaction. 
you use the Western merits, you are rational, you take the information, you use your ratio. But in Russia, it doesn't play any role. In Russia, it's important to have a belief in something. And if in the TV, which I shown, and they say, we couldn't do it, we are very good. Ukrainians have committed all the crimes, then it's easier for, for the people to believe that this is like that and not that they are fascists. Interview of uh, Bagrov, a very well-known actor, the main cult film in Russia was Brat Dva, uh, Brother Two a bandit who comes to U.S. and kills everything. This is the main film for the last 30 years. And Bobrov, and his interview was repeated one uh, permanently. He said, even my, if my country goes to um, a war, and even if my country is not, uh, uh, is not right, I still will defend my country. Such people think that their country, they themselves, they can never be blamed, they can never be guilty because they are always right. This is a way without um, outcome. But uh, that kind of belief that everybody has organized a concert of lies. Australian journalists, American journalists, everybody is lying. Well, it's because they have been brought up in Russia surrounded by lies. We have lived in the country of lies, and the Soviet Union has been the signal of that. The power was lying to us about communism, and we were very obedient communism builders. We were afraid of the power, therefore we also lied, and everybody understood that everybody was lying. The situation with the Crimea couldn't be possible in the West because if their power and government would lie to people, they wouldn't be elected next time. But Putin is lying that there are no Russian soldiers there. Nobody understood it. Everybody knew there were Russian sol soldiers, but Putin said no. Were people asking questions? No. But, uh, and even people thought, oh, well, this is very good. We are just trying to defeat the enemy. We are lying to the enemy, not our own people. I would give you one example. From your native Switzerland, I understand you are a Swiss, Swiss national. Yes, I congratulate you. In the Swiss media, there are two major media houses. Neue Swiss Zeitung and Rinier. We were visiting Rinier and their chief manager was very proud, saying, it was some three years ago, he was proud to say that we are very well informed about their things going on in Europe and also in Russia, because we have a very well paid consultant here, Schroeder, that was the rationality there. Uh, if you 
we're giving that example, I would like to say the following. I'm a Swiss national. It means that I'm responsible for everything going on in Switzerland. And I did not like everything that was going on considering Russia. At the beginning of 90s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was a window of possibilities because people in Russia, they took positively the ideas of democracy, though they didn't have any idea what democracy was. But they had seen American films and they wanted to see, to live like it was in American films. They can, Constitution, uh, Western cars, etc., etc., and West had to help Russian democracy to stand up. How could it be possible? Only uh, while showing how their state uh, uh, is functioning and the rule of law is functioning in a state. I was working as an interpreter. I saw how their huge machine of laundering dirty money from Russia was functioning. I saw how all the lawyers were very glad to get these, this dirty money, though they knew they were breaking the laws. When there are, there is huge money, the uh, rule of law disappears. And without that help of banks, uh, lawyers, uh, governments uh, in, uh, in West, the criminal uh, companies, uh, criminals, would not have possibility of uh, standing up and appearing. And now Western countries should supply Ukraine with rifles and weapons uh, in the bulk Ukraine needs and not try to find any excuses not to do it. There were possibilities, and there were there was a possibility uh, of stopping the aggressor at a certain point in time. The Olympic Games in the nineties in Russia there was n there were no there was no de-Stalinization or any real changes in Russia. Dictator says we have enemies in other countries, and that was the development. I tried to organize boycotts of the Olympic Games in Russia. I was asking the question who would you like to show solidarity with? But what? was uh, Switzerland doing. In Sochi, a big house was built and the dictator was praised by the Swiss capital and Swiss people. But that was the beginning of the war in Crimea. Now, Four years passed, and their football uh, world championship was going to start. The war was there in Ukraine. People were killed. History repeats itself. Again, I tried to organize boycott of their world championship. On the one hand, there is morale. On the other hand, fun and millions and millions of mm, money. And all the nations came to Russia to play uh, during the World Championship. So the roads for the 24th of February 2022 was open. Mm. 
you you were writing about the sportsmen. Yes, it it, it, it was uh, about the Olympics in Moscow. But now the 24th of February, open aggression against Europe. The Swiss president makes a speech saying we are a neutral state and we are not supporting any sanctions against Russia. I, I was so desperate to organize something and I failed. And on the 25th of February, I um, was uh, on a TV talk show, Arena. This is the main talk show in Switzerland. I said ev everything I wanted to. I, I said, dear Swiss, Swiss people, the neutrality era is over. And next, next day, their Swiss president declared, we are going to uh, support sanctions against uh, Russia. I felt very happy. I felt I could uh, achieve something. Democracy is a tool and means to em influence uh, the government. Uh, politicians, they don't care about wars. They want to be elected next time during their elections. So you can influence on their public opinion through TV and radio and media. And if you have to explain something to people, then politicians start to pay attention to these people. And of course, there was a huge wave of solidarity with Ukraine. Within one year, it has faded out, but now, now again, Swiss, Switzerland has said, we are neutral, we are not going to supply um, weapons to Ukraine even through third countries. What should we done? We shouldn't feel failed. We have to try and try again. We have to uh, support the public opinion and we have to influence the government and politicians so that they could supply weapons to Ukraine. Uh, well, at the beginning, they didn't want to uh, other countries to uh, to deliver uh, weapons to Ukraine, where there are uh, some components, Swiss uh, components. Uh, let's uh, let's um, just um, uh, let's just um, talk to the audience here. Yeah? So there are so many people who whose Russian is much better than uh, mine. Yeah. But I'd like to to offer an intrigue. We we have a writer, Mr. Yuri Sal, Professor Emeritus. He's a professor of criminology. Well, he started it, and then and then Mr. Wenzel answered him. Yeah. So, and then it was uh, published in one of our journal publications, Loaming. The, the intrigue would be, if these Russian top people, if they have, have uh, accepted this uh, Mongol Tata yoke to, to to uh, to uh, to slave its own um, population. Alexander Nevsky also made the same. He spent a lot of time with this uh, Mongol 
Mongol Tatar Khan and he also killed a lot of people for for that. And the subjectivity in, in, in Russia. So I mean the the the, the, the commanders, the, the those who uh, provide this uh, propaganda they, they they also slaves. Well the responsibility is being melted some somewhere. If there is a very, a very strict Khan, when in this uh, power vertical, no one is allowed to do anything. So, who is who is guilty? Well, your grand granddad was also kid, but these power people over there on top, they 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 are not guilty. So, and we have the situation where there is something bad and there are no guilty for this. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, this, uh, this is this is a mentality that people don't understand their um, collective responsibility. I, I, I was only said what to do and the responsibility is in the Kremlin. So we people, ordinary people have not started this war. Let's talk about what will happen to Russia. And to understand it, we have to have a look at what happened to Germany, fascist Germany. The first, what Germans were saying, they were saying we, don't, we didn't know anything. So the ordinary folk was saying we are, we are not guilty. So it was the Nazi regime. We were the victims of Nazi regime like all other peoples. This is what we'll hear, for sure we'll hear it. Oh, it turned out when on the TV it will be said that uh, that Putin is uh, an American spy. So, oh, that's the matter, and we didn't know it. We thought that we are very good, very, very good people. We wanted, we, we thought that we wanted to, to, uh, to release, to free the uh, the um, Ukrainian folk from uh, fascist, uh, uh, from fascism and Nazis in in U in Ukraine. Uh, the G German acceptance or um, realization of the uh, repentance. Uh, why was it uh, p possible? Because the uh, the um, uh, the uh, military forces of um, of the alliance allies uh, um, destroyed the German army, and only after that this national um, repentance was be uh, was possible, like Nuremberg and everything. So, and the same will be in Russia. So, just to destroy the military machine of the uh, of the country, and then the uh, question uh, um, arises: Who will um, uh, carry out the Nuremberg process? Yeah, I, I, I was trying to start reading books. Uh, uh, of Russian experts who were trying to uh, to uh, explain the uh, Russian politics uh, 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 well in uh, and their behavior with um, West and so on, and uh, they said that uh, the Putin has to build the bridges with the West and so on. And I wrote my book, and um, this was the history of my family and my. Uh, relatives, and the last two chapters are about the future. What will happen? So, uh, so, and uh, there I write that I would like the, the democracy to win, but uh, the main uh, future or chapter of the future is about what's going on today. This, this book is being published today in, in many languages. There is nothing personal. No. I I wrote only pre word and afterward. Yeah, this is the letter to Europe. And uh, well, it's clear what will uh, go on. Uh, so the war will continue until this non human sits in the Kremlin as soon as he uh, leaves or somebody. 
uh, just uh, uh, drives him out. It will happen. Um, in a year or several years, the war against Ukraine will start. Will uh, stop at the same at this very moment. I'm very optimistic about Ukraine. Like the whole world today is helping today Ukraine. Um, so, so and the world will help Ukraine to build up what was. Uh, what was uh, destroyed by the uh, Russian army, and on the border they will build a huge wall. And what will be behind the wall? Uh, here I am very uh, pessimistic. I, so this year I understood what Vla uh, Malevich uh, uh, meant with his black s square. So. He saw his future this way, and now in Russia there is the blue square. So it means, well, it's clear that at once there will be the, uh, the fight for power will start. Uh, and then the next step will be the disintegration of the empire. Today the, the Russian Federation is uh, uh, pregnant with the new uh, states like it used to be with the Soviet Union. And then this hygiene, high. Today we cannot say what will be the news. These new states, we will see it, and it will be life. Uh, because uh, earlier we learned about history uh, from newspapers and so on, which wrote history, and now the history will take place on the screen, because everyone sees everything at this moment when it is happening. Well, could could you tell me which color would you uh, use to make your square? Yeah, for Russia, you mean? Yes. If, well, uh, once I wrote an essay, uh, which was called Putin's Black Hole, and I remember how, uh, how uh, I was talking about, uh, told about the black hell, which uh, uh, took, takes everything, uh, uh, pulls everything inside. And then it happened. It was uh, 2014, I wrote it. It is the black hell. So Putin was there, and they, uh, they, they pull Ukraine there, or suck in Ukraine. Yeah, and uh, Ukraine and the whole world, and the black hell has no color. This is the black hell which sucks everything in. And the question about the post-Putin um, Russia, so there should be, of course, democracy, but it needs several um, um, conditions. So the first, the first, this is repeatance. So. To recognize it's uh, yours, uh, your uh, guilt. So to to recognize what uh, what uh, the Russian army made there and there in Bucha and different other places, and people would say, oh, so what what could we do? It was all Putin's fault, yeah. And then and free free uh, elections, even if they take place, uh, who will uh, organize it in all these republics? Who will Kadyrov, for example? Who who will organize the democratic elections? Thousands, thousands, um, hundreds of thousands of teachers um, who who participated in the falsification of Putin's uh, elections. Will they organize the free and honest elections, the, or the foreign agents, Khodorkovsky or Kasparov from America or from London? They would come and say, "Let's organize or let's set up democracy." And people would say, "No, no, no! We had already the, 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 the democracy in the 90s." Or Strelkovo Prigozhin, Prigozhin say, "So you see, we." We we oh, we will now bring the order. Yeah, if if uh, somebody tells people, uh, so you'll have democracy and chaos, and Prigozhin will say now we'll have or introduce order. So whom will people believe? And one more condition: for the democracy, you need the 
critical mass of citizens who understand what democracy is, how it works, what is the rule of law in the state. And I remember 2011-12, uh, we rented uh, an apartment in Ismailov in Moscow. I remember hundreds and thousands of people in Sakharov Prospect who were protesting, rallying peacefully. Where are they now? Yeah, they all uh, left Russia. What what peaceful rallies? What protest? You've seen it in Mis in Minsk, yeah. So peaceful protest as against violence. They give no results. Within twenty or thirty years, how many million people left Russia? Potential uh, citizens of the beautiful uh, future Russia, because they saw no future for their children. This is a dictatorship, the criminal dictatorship, which uh, which um, appeared in the 90s. It was updated within this period, and they, of course, uh, uh, learned the lessons of the Soviet period. Uh, and this dictatorship, which appeared in the 90s, they lived only on the sales of uh, gas and oil. They sell it all to the West, and why should they uh, share this money with the population? And they had quite a different idea. Uh, do you remember what Medvedev said when he was the president? If you don't like to be with us, the border is open. Uh, border is open. This is dictatorship of the 21st century, dictatorship with open borders. And they made everything that people who were not satisfied with them, that these people would leave Russia. So there are now 20 or 30 million people who would uh, create this uh, uh, critical mess. Uh, Mikhail, uh, let you answer some questions. Probably somebody has questions. Who has prepared questions? And now? Uh, I would say that you are very pessimistic about the future of Russia. Maybe it's uh, correct. I have nothing to add. Simply, uh, simply, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, events which are ta taking place now in Ukraine. It it uh, happened in. It it happened in another place. Where was it? Yeah, Maluta Skuratov. Yeah, it was here in Russia, and it was here in this territory. So, so, so history can repeat. Okay, the first question, please. In Russia, people don't know anymore how to think themselves because of the history in Russia. Second, their Orthodox Church also wanted to suppress people. I think these two factors are to be blamed. A new Gino fund has developed because of that. If we think about, uh, speak about the society, we have to define what kind of Russian society we mean. Everything which is going on is uh, pointing to that Olis theory. The serfdom, what you mentioned, and the Germans who came to Russia in the 19th century and started to rule it. Peter, Peter declared freedom of uh, their upper layers. So there was a kind of contradiction. Serve them on the one hand and free upper circles. And as to the church, from the very beginning, there was a school of serfs in Russia. Uh, 
Could it be mended and changed if uh, we could create a new Russia from the Russian-speaking people which could exist in, under the rule of law, but people who have left Russia and who have been educated in the democratic countries who work for democracies, who are people uh, the others are proud of in these countries. It means uh, people have some potential. The Russia, Russia has to get rid of their burden of that old territory. We can also take the first after-revolutionary emigration, but we know now that the first, first generation is very good, second generation is so-so, the third generation, they don't feel any contact with Russia anymore. But now, within these um, 100 years, we have had high technologies the first uh, generation of emigrants, uh, they had some literary circle somewhere in the middle of nowhere or in other countries. They were lonely there. But now, if you have Wi-Fi, you are in um, uh, on a train in an African country, you can always connect yourself to Russia or any other country. You have contacts nowadays. I would like to be a citizen of Russian culture with Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, and no Putin. And I would like to live in the country who is not dependent on the territory. That could be virtually possible, maybe. That's a wonderful picture of uh, future Russia. Next question, please. Good evening, Mikhail. I'm a teacher from Ukraine, the teacher of Ukrainian cult literature and language. You mentioned teachers, yes, really. When the star, uh, war started, you can't imagine how difficult it was to hold Rush, uh, uh, lessons of uh, literature. I did not tell the children about their atrocities, butcher events. I, I would not imagine what kind of teachers were there, the students of whom went to Pucha, went to other places in Ukraine, and carried out these atrocities. I'm very nervous. I experience everything so very painful for me. I was teaching literature in the classes and human values. I don't think any of my pupils would kill anybody. And my question now, what is the morale? What kind of culture is there? How the new generation is educated in Russia so that they would be able to bomb my country? Thank you for this question. It's a very broad topic. It is the question, what is Russian culture? Putin and Butcher, are they connected with Russian literature? Yes. Of course, you can't say that they were reading Dostoevsky and then they ran to kill Ukrainians. You have to understand what it means, Russian culture. 
it's uh, a totally different thing in Eula's Russian state. Doesn't need any culture at all. Uh, Stalin didn't need any Shostakovich. He banned him. But there were Western countries, US and in America. There is a Congress uh, of uh, peace. Somebody had to be sent there. And Shostakovich is sent there to participate, but as a face of Stalinist regime. And this is their thing that uh, the regime wanted to kill, destroy all their people who were connected uh, with culture. But yes, as if we own a Tolstoy, and this means that we are very good. Actually, culture was always used and misused for evil aims in order to suppress any freedom, free ideas, so that people would be silent. Silence is the strategy of survival of generations. Pushkin has also mentioned it. In order to survive, people kept silent. And this is what the regime demands from people and population. Only culture could protest and was protesting against this system. And therefore, in schools, there has never been the possibility of free ideas. In schools, there were only portraits of hero pioneers on the walls. The essence of the school was not to teach people free ideas. No, just the contrary. The task of the school was to explain to the students that they have to die for their fatherland. That was the essence of the school. And this is what the teachers were teaching them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to introduce Vlisna Tilizanin. I'm from Estonia. I'm a Russian speaker from Estonia. And here is my question. In Estonia, I'm always uh, very often asked, are you Estonian, Russian? I am an Estonian speaking Russian, and so on. If to lead it to absent, who, then we can ask, who are Russian people? So this is the question. I just start, started with it. Now we have to ask who are Russian people? Who are Russian people? For me, I can say, or I can talk about myself. I, I am a part of this uh, world culture which speaks Russian. This is for me, my Russia, my culture, my language. And of course, Sure. If this language and this uh, uh, culture grew on this tree of Ulus, the, it, its sense, its core is from there. And even if this uh, culture is uh, filled with hate to this regime, it grew up together with the regime. And again, when we re uh, revalue all our um, values, so, so we have to pay attention to it and our language. If you uh, attentively look at the language, at the Russian language, so, so we are talking without paying attention the great Russian literature. But, but, but in reality, what we today uh, are calling the uh, empressness. So, so where did 
have we taken the word this uh, great Russian literature? So it started in in the, in the um, Stalin period. So the Russians have invented radio and and uh, uh, and locomotion. So and the Russian literature is a great one. And we we are talking about it, not thinking about it. Uh, so. Probably we have to think about it, but the Russian language cannot exist w without this system of suppressing of the p personality. So th th there, there is a war. The war. So, uh, in the war, the uh, life is going on according to the um, laws of a prison. Prison. The strong one, the stronger one, will dictate you the whole life. But uh, it. it it all is reflected in the language, yeah, because the language reflects the reality. And nowhere in the other languages there is the, um, uh, the cursing words as popular as in Russia. And this is what shows the empressness of the language. And in this um, cursing, in the cursing, the role of a personality is being brought down to the bottom. And this is the uh, typical situation in a prison and now in the war. And this imperial, let's say, status of, uh, of Russia is expressed in it. When today we are reading classical literature, we have to understand that every classical writer, and so may I talk about Dostoevsky? Yeah. Dostoevsky, all his life was uh, continuing or trying to finish the third part of the dead cells of uh, Gogol. So it's about Chichikov who wanted to go to Siberia and find their uh, God, Jesus Christ, because Gogol was in, in, the, in the prison. And uh, he understood that uh, no revolution can help uh, Russia. Only people have to find the Christ within them. Yeah. And so, I, so th th this was uh, accepted as the Russian soul. So the person is looking for something, searching for something irreal, irrational. So it it was uh, semi uh, Dostoevsky because there is another Dostoevsky which uh, nobody knows, but but, but Dostoevsky asks you or oh, oh. Dostoevsky says that do you have to to find the uh, Jesus Christ, but and then he asks which one because they're different. There is the correct one and not correct one, incorrect one. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ. So, and the Orthodox Church is considered to be the best one. And then this, um, this, the, 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 uh, the uh, Orthodox Church being uh, related and connected with the power. So they are. Uh, this is the other way of finding the Christ. So I always uh, read uh, Dostoevsky, uh, Tolstoy, Tolstoy uh, when I was in a hospital. And uh, of course, uh, I was reading and rereading. And, and uh, sometimes uh, you don't pay attention. So uh, something seems to, to be too, too simple and so on. But now, w when, when you see the war, you can understand what she read in a different way. He negates all the uh, on all the uh, um, achievements of the Western uh, civilization. He says the truth is in the Russian man who is um, uneducated, yeah, redneck. So you, you may, you have to love our classical uh, writers, but you have to understand in a different way. Yeah, so the next one. I, I have a kind of a comment yeah, about the 90s. Many and also the opposition 
uh, say that uh, what, what what happened in the 90s, this, uh, the West is uh, guilty and uh, that they didn't help enough and so on. So the West is guilty that Russia developed as it developed. But on the other way, I never will. There were so many donor organizations, different uh, NGOs and so on. They supported Russia in the 90s. The civil society, they supported the civil society. And and different organizations. And, and at, at the end, they Uh, what, what happened later, they, they destroyed the textbook which was published by these organizations. And there is a very good article by Applebaum, who statistical, statistically shows uh, that the, the assistance from the West was really huge. And the, what's your question? Yeah, I said, uh, I just wanted to comment. I, I just wanted to discuss, to argue a little bit. Uh, uh, it seems to me that too much guilt is placed in the West. I do agree with you. I'm, sorry. I'm the next one. I, I absolutely agree with you that the main guilt is not on the West, but on, the, on, on Russia. The main guilt. Well, you please. I admit, I'm also. I was also born in 1961. Yeah, eight years I lived in Russia, and I have, I have, I have a very good answer to your question, sir. Uh, the the way to the uh, hell is uh, made by very good um, thoughts, yeah, ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you please. Sana, I'm a migrant from Russia, a political one. My question, uh, in one of your, this is, you were uh, saying that you sent uh, some losers to uh, learn German. And what about the Russian language now? Thank you. It was the last but, by, but one question. Well. At the end, there should be always something optimistic. But here I can say the following about uh, this is my pain for my uh, language, my pain. Because uh, the Putin regime has uh, placed the language under the fire. As we are saying, the f fire is shot is directed on the squares. 100, 100 years ago, Russian migrants spoke in a loud uh, language in Russian in, in Paris and uh, Berlin. And now uh, in the streets, in the streets of the European cities, Russians are speaking with a low voice because the Russian language has lost its own its destiny. And what would happen to it, how people will uh, speak, or what they will do with the language which uh, has lost its dignity, destiny, I don't know. When Thomas Mann uh, visited America in 1938, he, uh, he went to the university to talk to students, but students didn't want to listen to him in, in, in his language. They said, we don't want to, to learn your language because you are the counter-aggressor. Well, could you imagine what, uh, what uh, would happen if German would have won? But he, he fought. Uh, every week he knew that maybe no one was uh, listening to him. He, 
uh, he uh, had his radio um, program. He was talking about Holocaust, uh, who was Hitler, and so on. No one listened to him, 1945. Because in 1945, when Germans were asked, didn't you know anything about Holocaust? No, 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 we didn't know anything. Why did he do it? He was fighting for the destiny of his language, of the uh, German language. He wanted to save the destiny of the um, German culture and literature. And this is, uh, and uh, now I am in the same position. Yeah, the great parallel. But then Germans were fought were crushed, and now such a challenge st is oh, the, oh, the, 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 Russian, the, the, the Russian people, the, the diaspora, they face such a uh, challenge, you know, because now everything Russian is under fire. Like in Tartu, in Estonia, there was a scandal. Lenor Garalik. And it will develop. And I understand very well the feelings of the Russians, and I accept it. But this is the reality we, we have to live now with our Russian language. Well, God bless you and give you energy. The last question to Mikhail Shishkin. Hello, I'm Georgi. I write about Russia for Estonians in the Estonian language Levila publication. Uh, well, I just wanted to add some sharpness to the topic, because the topic is what will happen to Russia and who will be responsible. Well, really, your concept is very interesting and uh, beautiful, what led to this war. and. Uh, I think that it's very, it's great to build up concepts, but for me as a Russian person who, who was born in Estonia, I am worried about what will be in the future, how to live, and if we leave this room with uh, such a fatalist note, so it will be like in 10 minutes too. So, and probably somebody will be happy that, yes, Russian is bad, and they will laugh and mock. What should we do? How to behave, not to have uh, fatalism, not to jump into lava? The, so the first, nothing good will happen with the, the Russian culture and language as long as uh, Ukraine uh, wins the war. It means that we all have to do everything possible for this victory. And after that, everyone will do what he or she can to save the Russian culture as the part of the world culture. Uh, Mikhail Shishkin, I'm very happy that you came. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a great uh, meeting with you. So, there were no angry questions. I was, uh, I prepared, you know, for angry questions, but there were none. Thank you.